Ladies and gentlemen, may I now come to the pièce de résistance of our traditional DS meetings and DS anniversaries. This is this year's DS lecture. And who else than Franz Timmermans to prepare and to present here his views, and we look very much forward to this year's DS lecture. Dr. Timmermans. And I got up here without falling, even with a cuppa. <laughs> uh, Rector Magnificus, members of the college, ladies and gentlemen, one of the guilty pleasures of being able to stand here today is that for the next half hour or so, all these professors have to listen, <laughs> cannot talk back, cannot get up. So I will share that guilty pleasure with the students in the audience. Um, and most of all, I want to again thank this university for this incredible honor they have bestowed on me today. This city is the place I was born. We left Maastricht when I was three years old to go to Paris, but oddly enough, Maastricht never left me. For 50 years now, I have been here without ever living here. As I said before, the coming into being of this university is also part of my heritage, my family's heritage. My grandfather talked about it a lot because he saw it almost as a personal compensation for the closure of the coal mine he had worked in for more than 40 years. And of course, he hoped that I would study here close to home so that I did not need to move elsewhere because the experience by then was that people from our region who moved elsewhere never came back. But above all, he wanted me to go to university. He, who had far more talent than myself, had to leave school when he was 12 years old because he had to earn money for an impoverished widower's family. Talent, what is that? And how do we engage it? That is the theme of my lecture today. In one part of my family, not using talent was seen as an insult to God, since it was his decision to bestow us with talent. In the other part of my family, the red part of my family, not using talent was seen as betraying our class, because we were not there because we didn't have talent, we were there because we were not allowed to exploit our talent. So exploiting our talent, improving our social economic situation was seen as a duty to our class. But from both sides of the family, the message was clear. Not exploiting the potential of your talent was a sin. The moral imperative was very strong. I felt it all my life. There are serious downsides to this, but the complete absence of such an imperative, which one sometimes perceives in today's society, is in my view, a problem for communities and for individuals. Talent is at the crossroads of luck and hard work. Probably everyone is talented at something, but many people will spend their whole lives without unlocking the full potential of their talents. For Stephen King, the prolific author, talent is cheaper than table salt. In his view, what separates the talented individual from the successful one is a lot of hard work. I believe there is more. There is also opportunity, the right time and place. Would anyone have ever heard of Winston Churchill without the Second World War? And there is luck, or should I say serendipity. We tend to approach talent as a very individual or personal thing, but when it is not without the possibility of unlocking it, one is not able to unlock it if it is not placed in a community. Unlocking talent is impossible without community. Talent 
never comes to fruition in isolation. It needs to be stimulated, challenged, seduced, put to the test. Albert Einstein said that it was not his talent that led to his success, but his curiosity. I believe curiosity is a driving force for innovation. Curiosity combined with optimism and, very importantly, dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction with things as they are. An educational system is successful if it can awaken innate curiosity, stimulate dissatisfaction, and foster the optimism that we can indeed improve the world with dedication and inventiveness. Talent is like gold, useless if it is not dug up, polished, and molded into something useful. So the question for a university is not just how to foster excellence, but also how to master what Goethe called the current of the world. Goethe said, in, I think it was in, um, in uh, one of his Maxim, Goethe said that success was a combination of talent and character. Talent develops in silence, but character needs the current of the world. So how does the university engage this current of the world? Let me step back for a minute here and share a personal experience. After returning to the Netherlands, I went to a secondary school in Heerlen, the Bernardinus College, really an outstanding educational facility. I immediately felt at home. I quickly made friends. One boy I admired from a distance because his talents were intimidating. He was great at football, he was very smart, he was well-read, very popular, and a free spirit, almost impossible to handle by teachers. I was convinced he would first become a professional football player and later on would win the Nobel Prize for science and literature. He dropped out of school, made a conscious decision to devote his life to the use of drugs, and never reconsidered. I've not seen him at least 10 years, but I think about him quite a lot. Did I fail him? Or did the system fail him? Did he let himself down? Or should I be open-minded and conclude that he made a conscious choice that we have to uh, accept? I don't think there's a real answer here, but I think the question needs to be put. Let me get back to the current of the world. Universities should not only ensure that they are fully part of the current of the world, but should have the ambition to shape and steer that current. This is needed for academic success and economic recovery, for sure. But it is also needed for political and societal recovery. Our society is in need of redefining citizenship and civility. Citizenship in an, increasing dive, an increasingly diverse and interdependent society is not as easy to define as in the past. What is responsible citizenship? To be law-abiding? To vote? To pay taxes? Yes, it is. But that only defines our relationship with institutions. And given the complexity of our society, we can no longer defer the responsibility for our relation between people to institutions. This is something we will have to start doing ourselves. We need to rediscover the skill of civility. And here, I see a huge role for academia. For economic growth and jobs, we need scientific breakthroughs and greater synergy between those breakthroughs and their practical application in the market. This will only happen if there is a symbiotic relationship between public authorities, the economic sector, and the educational sector at large, all levels of education. This can only come about if it is founded on public trust. And here is where things are not in order in our society. Distrust and a lack of self-confidence have weakened the very foundation of our society. It creates a blockade for necessary reform and a fear for innovation. But most of all, it seriously limits the possibility of synergy between people and communities. Perhaps we should look at some figures very briefly. 
Around 5.5 million young people are unemployed in the European Union, which means that one in five people under 25 who are willing to work cannot find a job. The unemployment rate among young people is over 20%, double the rate for all age groups combined, and nearly three times the rate for the over 25s. 7.5 million people aged 15 to 24 are currently neither in a job nor in education or training. The rest of the world is doing a lot better. And if we don't start doing better ourselves, they will beat us at everything and we will be left behind. Every year, six million young Europeans drop out of school with at best a lower secondary education. There is at the same time a huge demand for practitioners in all sorts of jobs, and we can't find them. The bottlenecks are largest in the UK, Germany, and Italy, especially in sciences, ICT, uh, and other technical jobs. This is something we need to redress. The European Union will be the partner of society, but society here at large will have to take a responsibility. This will require a number of approaches. We need to bridge the gap between school and the workplace. Some countries are very good at this. Germany is better than others, but still it's not good enough. We need to create connections with all levels of education. To give you one concrete example, I think Maastricht University could do a lot more in combining its efforts with RWTH in Aachen because they have complementary skills. Maastricht University is much better at research at the highest level, and Aachen is, I think, better at applying research and technologies. And I think there is huge potential there in combination also with Hogeschool Zuid and other institutions. Not enough is done to connect the possibility with companies. If you see what has been achieved in the region of Eindhoven with Brainport, I think there is a lot we can learn from that. I know Maastricht University is part of that, but the wider region has not used the full potential of that uh, possibility. Skills and values should be transmitted. That will be the main uh, focus of my lecture further on. But I think that transmitting skills is only half of the job. We also need to transmit values to next generations and to share values with newcomers in our society. To, have, to, to get this to work, we need a greater adaptability of both skilled and not yet skilled people. There is need of a form of parenthood in applying the skills and in learning the skills from each other. And what I find, if I compare it with the United States, I spent a couple of weeks at Yale learning and a couple of days teaching. And I asked them, how many of your students drop out? The answer was actually none. Now, of course, I know that they make it so difficult to get in, but then it's also difficult to drop out. But if a student in Yale gets into trouble, professors will be all over her or him to find out why, because they know they are skilled enough, and they help them also in social situations or personal situations. And I think that sort of approach vis-a-vis -vis students, accompanying students, not just academically, is perhaps part of the future for Europe as well. And then, of course, there's lifelong learning. I'm sure I don't need to go into that for this audience. Another element is that we need to rethink international mobility and start with it at an early age. I think that most students today would love to spend some time in another country. They need to do it, not just a couple of weeks, not in this bubble that never uh, uh, teaches you anything about a foreign country, but at least six months, preferably a year or more. You will not just learn a new culture in a new uh, country, you will learn who you are. It is only by being elsewhere that you understand who you are yourself. The comparison Mike, I make is always with a fish. You, take a, you leave a fish in water, you ask the fish to define water, the fish will not be able to do that, even if I would assume that the fish would be able of conscience thought. But if you take it out of the water, it would immediately know what it is. And that is the same with your own culture and your own nationality. You will know it when you're out of it, not before that. And we also need to concentrate efforts on the neglected potential. There is still, incredibly, there is still huge neglected potential in women in Europe, certainly in minorities, 
and also in physically challenged people who are too easily um, forgotten. And we need to attract talent. And here, there's a problem because we fear migration more so that we don't see the need for migration given the demographic figures that Europe is going to face. We need to overcome that fear. I could go on forever. And most of these things you will have heard before. If all of this is, is to succeed, we will have to rediscover the beauty of a number of values that perhaps did not deserve to be neglected as much as they have been the last couple of years or decades. How is it possible that we now have the most gifted, the healthiest, the best educated, the best connected generation growing up in Europe, and we are so dismal at putting them in pole position for the future? I believe we've lost track of the natural relationship between generations. When I was professor at Utrecht University, I enjoyed every minute of my conversations with my students. I love to share my experience, my thoughts, my convictions. I loved even more to challenge them, to provoke them, invite them to share their world with me. And I learned our worlds are more different than the superficial image of our egalitarian society might suggest. In times of rapid and fundamental change in societies, the risk of a rift between generations is always present. Parents are part of the old world, children of the new. Ideally, they help each other understand both. In reality, sometimes, this does not work. In 1778, Goethe wrote his famous poem, Der Erlkönig, known until today by most Germans because it is very often taught in secondary schools. It is a story of a father riding a horse at night through the woods with his infant son in his embrace. The son tells him of his fear for the Erlkönig, a mythical forest figure who wants to take him away. The father dismisses his fears, says that the son misunderstands, but at the same time, he hurries to get back home. The Erlkönig whispers to the son that he wants him to join him, otherwise he will kill him. The son desperately calls out to his father, who does not understand. When he arrives home, the father discovers that his son is dead. I've always found it telling that this poem was written two years after American independence and one year before the French Revolution. The world was changing fundamentally, and the old world fathers were going to lose their sons to a completely new world they knew or felt was coming, but refused to acknowledge. Arguably, we live in equally revolutionary times. My generation has learned to use the information society. My children's generation is the information society. We should make a bigger effort to understand the consequences, and we should rediscover the wonders of classical Parenthood, I mean this metaphorically. Last year, one of my great heroes died, Robin Williams. Two of his most admirable films are about the relationship between generations, or about fatherhood, Dead Poet Society, and Goodwill Hunting. The opening of hearts and minds to the wonders of knowledge and feeling, experiencing society, and the world is a theme of the films. The father figure respects the young person's talent, and the young persons respect the father's character and experience. Taking the responsibility to lead and accepting this leadership as a precondition to consequently be able to make your own choices, to follow the lead or make your own paths. To understand that before accepting or refuting an example, you first need to grasp its meaning and that it was given in good faith. In both films, letting go becomes the fulfillment of curiosity, dissatisfaction, and understanding. This is, in my view, ideally how the relationship between students and professors should be in a university. And there is a more general point here, very topical in today's society. The trust that is inherent in this intergenerational relationship is an essential component for the functioning of pluriform democracy, democratic societies. This cannot be accommodated 
in citizenship alone. This needs a measure of civility, of consensual behavior, of respect for societal norms that cannot be codified in laws. Again, I will ask Robin Williams to help me here. He once told his audience the following story. It was a big and important military parade in London, and there were many international guests. And the Queen Mum sat, sat next to um, the King of Bhutan. And a big horse came by, and the horse farted rather loudly. And the Queen Mum said to the King of Bhutan, I'm so sorry. And the King of Bhutan said, don't worry, my dear. I, thought, I think they thought it was a horse. <laughs> there is no law that prohibits farting in public. But we still do not consider it civil to do it. We try not doing it out of respect for the other. And we certainly hope the other will return the favor. All too often, this aspect of mutual respect is overlooked when we discuss about rights like freedom of speech. Without freedom of speech, we would erode all personal freedoms that European Enlightenment gave humanity around and after the French Revolution. When freedom of speech is challenged, we have a duty to respond with all means that the rule of law offers us and we have to act with all its instruments. But there is no harm in taking someone's feelings into account when exercising the right to freedom of speech. Taking the trouble of looking at the world through the eyes of another human being is not a sign of weakness, but of strength, and a cornerstone of what I would call civility. Incidentally, what characterizes and to some extent dehumanizes fanatics and terrorists is their total refusal to do just that. They refuse to even take a small look through the eyes of another person. On the contrary, they want to gorge out everyone's eyes and replace them by theirs. This ultimately leads to totalitarian societies or to disintegration of societies, and perhaps that is exactly their goal. Let me briefly illustrate how commonplace and important civility can be at the same time. Most of you will know the TV show, Yes, Prime Minister, especially the professors among you. In it, Sir Humphrey is civil to a fault. When he thinks the Prime Minister is talking total rubbish, he says, yes, Prime Minister, you are right, up to a point. And when he sees the Prime Minister is about to do something that will get him into deep trouble, he says, very courageous, Prime Minister. The code is understood by the Prime Minister, but he doesn't lose face, and they take the right decision. For an example of uncivil behavior, I turn to another British TV show, Little Britain. Probably known better by their students. A customer walks into a travel agency with a very simple and straightforward request, only to be rebuffed by a lady who could not be bothered with the words, computer says no. <laughs> the two faces of our society in two different sketches in a nutshell. We need to move away of the computer says no society to the very courageous society. The point I'm trying to make here today is that unlocking talent requires so much more than stimulating academic excellence. And I believe universities should not be too modest in defining their role in that context. Universities are uniquely placed to create, maintain, improve, innovate communities. It is so right that Mr. Wells should be honored here today and that Wikipedia should be honored here today and with the Erasmus Prize because it is one of the most inspiring examples of a new community 
that stimulates understanding and therefore strengthens our civility. Wikipedia is a form of modern civility. And also letting go and trusting that community, Mr. Wales talked about it just now, shows that it is possible to create civility with modern means in a modern society, and I salute Mr. Wales for having done that. In our complex, multifaceted societies, civility becomes increasingly important to maintain a sense of community. If there is no sense of community and one relies only on state structures, society will either deteriorate into autocracy or disintegrate into opposing groups. This would certainly awaken some of Europe's most horrible nightmares. In this context, there is an urgent issue I want to raise here today. In France, and now also in the United Kingdom, polls show that a majority of the Jewish community seriously doubts whether they have a future in Europe. Through the ages, rising anti-Semitism has always been a precursor of tragedy time and again in Europe. Saving Europe, saving all we hold dear, begins with a common endeavor to take away the fears of a Jewish community without whom Europe will lose its soul. Later this month, we will commemorate 70 years of the liberation of Auschwitz. The very reason of European integration, the very coming into being of European integration, is not European institutions, is not European law, is not the euro, the common market, anything else linked with Europe. The reason for European integration, and I want to end on that, is that there will never again be Auschwitz on the European continent. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>